Hi, Dr. Strana. Hello. Hi. Uh, can you tell us what kind of doctor you are and where you're located? Yeah, I'm I'm a urologist uh, and I work and live in Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden. Um, and I've been I'm mostly working on or almost only on with prostate cancer and do research uh, part time on that too. So I'm associate professor at the university here too. Um, also with work on prostate cancer. And, and many of your patients, um, you, you've you offered active surveillance as an alternative to surgery. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've been, um, we've been working with uh, screening for prostate cancer with uh, um, um, mentor of mine, Professor Hugoson, that has been uh, working here with a, one of the first screening studies from 1994. So we found a lot of, of uh, really, uh, well, sort of insignificant prostate cancer. So we started active surveillance quite early. So we've been doing that for uh, since end of the 90s um, in, in different ways. So we, and, and we are doing more screening uh, studies at the moment. So it's, it's the same thing. We, we find screening uh, has the, the downside of detecting a little bit too much prostate cancer. So um, that that's why active surveillance really is the big, uh, big thing. Yeah, and cancer is one of those things where you really don't want too much of it ever. So no, 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 that's true. It's very true. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about how screening. Well, less screening, more about what we see using MRIs and scans and things yeah. as a way to help uh, both doctors and patients understand what's going on inside their body under their mm -hmm. flesh. Uh, what's interesting about today and unique is that usually uh, presentations about MRIs and scanning and such are conducted with radiation oncologists who are usually or radiologists even sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're the ones that read the things and tell us yeah. and write up the reports. You're a surgeon. You're the yep. person who actually has to do something with that information uh, in most cases. So yep. that's why we're you and I are talking to yep. the thousand or so people who are listening. Mm -hmm. What's the other angle of the yep. use of MRIs for prostate cancer patients? Well, it's it's um, uh, it's it's a well, it's not a new tool, but it's a tool that uh, we've um, come to use more and more, like the past ten years, and it's it's um, it's it's a, has been a bit difficult to know how much you can trust these images and we're, we're learning more and more uh, about how much we can trust them and there's been two schools uh, until fairly recently where one says that you cannot trust it at all and the other one says you can trust it 100 percent. so it's um you have some countries that have gone in to use a lot of mri very early in europe it's norway and uh, great britain to uh, quite big extent have used it and a lot while some other countries have been slower to adapt it and in sweden we've been a little bit more reluctant to to use it full out but we're coming more and more and for the past three or four years it's been used a lot uh, so when you say used uh i mean everybody who ha are you suggesting everyone who has prostate can has a positive biopsy goes in for an mri or the minute their uh, psa is elevated you do mris first yes yeah, it's, it's before the biopsies it's 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 shifted so for the past year the national guideline states that we should start off with if you have a um, increased psa then you start off with an mri and if the mri is okay you don't see anything on that and the psa is well, comparable you talk about psa density so it's compared to the size of the prostate that you can see on the mri uh, then you might not even have to do the biopsies at all because um, one of the problem with the biopsies is that we have more and more resistant uh, multi-resistant bacteria so you have infections and um, and infections that are difficult to treat so um, this is a way of reducing the number of biopsies. That's one of the advantages of starting off with the MRI. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I think in the Latin, here in the United States in the last 15 years, 20 years, uh, yeah. biopsies are soft pedaled. It's almost as if it's not a form of surgery, when in fact it is. And the infection rate, um, well, perhaps you could talk about that for the infection rate and the death rate from uh, biopsies that you've uh, seen. 
Yeah, it's it's uh, the infection rate is a few, uh, at least a few percent uh, of of infections that we detect, and we know that we don't see all the infections because some they go to the GPs and they get uh, uh, antibiotics. So it's it's even more. But it's about in Sweden today, and I think even in in Europe, and I'm not sure about the numbers in the states, but it, about three or four percent of the patients get one uh, get an infection that you need antibiotics for that we know of anyway. And one, well, a few of these uh, have serious infection and have to go uh, hospitalized. And a few of these get really serious. And death so far is not very common, luckily enough. But uh, I know of at least one uh, death in Sweden in the past years due to biopsies, which is absolutely, we cannot have that. It's, it's, uh, I mean, these are healthy patients that don't even have a cancer diagnosis that you more or less risk your life by taking biopsies. I mean, it, it's it's not even, well, it's really, really rare that you get that bad. But it's, I mean, we have to reduce the number of biopsies. And because um, taking biopsies is the only way to know if there is a prostate cancer. Yeah. Um, now we're talking about transrectal biopsies too. So it's... Um, it's it's um, you can take biopsies perineal too, and that may be l lower risk of infections. But it's so uh, we don't really know that yet either. Right, and and just so we will understand, I mean the uh, transrectal, like um, if this is a penis, this yeah. is uh, testicles. Transrectal yeah. is sort of through here. Is that fair? Or maybe you could uh, show us. No, it's it. It would. Oh, I can actually show you. Oh, excellent! We uh, <laughs> models are the best. Go ahead, aren't they? Yeah. So these, uh, you go through the. Uh, it's, it's ah right, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So the rectum, and they have the prostate here. If you just see, uh, there's a transection of the lower. You have the uh, os pubis, the pubic bone here. The bladder is behind that one, and the prostate is below that. And the urethra go through the prostate and out to uh, through the penis. And just beho below, behind that, you have the rectum, uh, which means that you have a very short way from the prostate, uh, from the rectum to the prostate here. And this is where you take the biopsies usually, uh, which means that you have bacteria in the rectum, of course. And that, that's one of the reasons why you can get bacteria into the prostate. There are some, some centers, they take the biopsies here in the perineum between the, the scrotum and the, uh, and the um, rectum, which is one way of not having this contamination. Uh, but it's more difficult to take them that way. And it hurts a bit more because one of the advantages of doing this is that you don't have any uh, pain receptors up here in the rectum. So it doesn't really hurt. And you can put uh, anesthetics around here. While in the um, skin, it hurts. So you have to have better anesthetics and everything. Yeah. And um, just as a sidebar, we'll, uh, and somewhat off track for our conversation today, but like yeah. a lot of people wonder, you know, do, do the biopsies actually take uh, cancer cells out of the prostate and drag them into the rest of the body? Um, no, no, yeah. I can, I can, I can say that. No, that's not the case. It's been, it's a, it's a really good question. It's been asked quite a lot of times, but it, there's been a lot of studies when they looked at, at uh, biopsies and re-biopsies for, for patients with active surveillance and uh, in screening programs. And uh, you cannot, you have not in any of these studies seen any uh, worse cancers or um, more spread cancers or anything like that from multiple biopsies. So I think we can rule that one out, that it's, that is not an issue. There are tumors that that can happen to, like kidney tumors and stuff that it should be, or um, carcin some, some, um, sarcomas and things like that well you shouldn't uh, do that but prostate cancer is not one of them great so i guess let's start this by talking about the different kinds of mris uh the different tesla units uh multi-parametric what's oh, yeah. that you know the whole <laughs> and uh and then we can talk about the different uh contrast agents dyes etc pluses yeah, and yeah. minuses and then ultimately let's get to what what is it that you see and what's useful about it from an mri so what yeah. are the different kinds of mris well you have you have uh, different but it, it's uh, um it's uh, based on that um on on that you can actually um uh 
um, magnetize uh, everything in your body. It's it's sort of uh, so you 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 put your body in a, a strong magnetic field, and uh, uh, then you put that magnetic field on and off, and then you get um, um, all the cells in the body uh, radiate some uh, well, uh, get magnetic fields that differ when you put this great magnetic field on and off. This is not really my area exactly how this technically works, but <laughs> but basically you can put different strength on this magnetic field. And that's when you talk about the 1.5 Tesla or the 3 Tesla or the uh, whatever cameras. And really simplified, the higher the number, the more accurate pictures or the more details you can get in the picture. It's not entirely true, but it's it's one of the, the things that you can do uh, to make a picture better. So. More and more, it's the three Tesla cameras that are um, are used. Uh, 1.5 is still fairly common, but there are tests with five Tesla, seven Teslas, and other cameras too. Uh, so we'll see. But it's then it's even stronger magnetic field, so it's uh, powerful in different ways, difficult to use in other ways. And then you can also amplify this uh, strength by using a rectal coil put to put one of the magnetic coils inside the rectum too, which is not that common anymore. It was usually when you had the lower magnetic field. So you can compensate that by increasing the field to some extent too, which is less uh, of, uh, well, it's not very comfortable with the endorectal coil. You have to lie in this uh, magnetic field in this small tube for well, between 20 and 40 minutes. And uh, so this is uh, one of the things that you don't have to use today, usually anyway. And multi-parametric, what's that all about? Uh, you can do this, you can see these pictures in different ways. Uh, the basic one, you see the, um, you see the an anatomical, um, it's the T2 weighted, it's called, it, you can have the T1, T2 weighted, it's different way of, of, of doing these magnetic on and off switches. But it's uh, basically you see the uh, anatomical uh, references of this. But then you can add different ways of looking. You can add um, contrast uh, fluid that takes uh, is taken into the prostate and then you can do uh, images on where this um, contrast uh, fluid uh, is uh, taken up in, and it takes it up a bit differently in tumor tissue than in normal prostate tissue. And you can also do something called diffusion weighted. You can see how, um, how densely packed the cells are. And, that, and if they're very densely packed, then there is less fluid around them. And you can measure this also with the MRI, how, because, when you switch this field on and off, uh, you, you can see if it's fluid or if it's cells and stuff like that. And if it's more densely packed, it looks differently on this diffusion weighted. It's a different way of doing it. Then, then you weigh all these different um, types of, of um, MRI together uh, and you, you look at all of them uh, to see if you see something on them. Because some tumors are, you can see on the T2 weighted pictures on the anatomic, some of them you can see on the diffusion weighted, and some of them you can see with the contrast. And together they are the multi-parametric. It's uh, and uh, usually it's it's at least three ways of doing it uh, has been the standard, but it takes quite a long time. That's why it takes 40, 45 minutes to do this. Uh, and Usually it's enough with just doing the diffusion weighted and the anatomical, the T2 weighted. So it's more and more becoming biparametric, which means that you can save about half the time of this and you don't have to put the contrast, which is a, um, a, um, a pharmaceutical uh, substance that you, you have to inject um, and which there are concerns that it may affect, um, that it may be um, stored in your body uh, in, in in long term we don't really know that it's not been proven but it's better safe than sorry in in a way there 
Yeah, uh, and so. that, that's yep. truly good news for our patient population. So many men have been complaining about metallic tastes, uh, concerned uh -huh. about dementia eventually, yeah. uh, people who have had multiple MRIs and uh, gondolinium or the, the other kinds of exactly. contrast yeah. coming into their bodies four or five times at, at, a, yeah. at the extreme, but two or three times uh, on... on uh, well, it wouldn't be the extreme if you do it on active surveillance because that could, then it could be active surveillance for 20 years or something like that with a small tumor. And then you would probably have to have a number of, of uh, MRI um, uh, exams during that time, and which means that maybe every second year for, for 20 years, then it's 10 times. And then you really have to, to look at what you... I mean, it's, once it's not, it's, it's nothing, but it's, uh, if it's 10 times or more, then absolutely you have to be concerned with what you do. Sure. And it's not just the, the physical impact, it's the emotional impact. I imagine being anxious yeah, yeah. Uh, that you're doing more harm to yourself than good when absolutely. the whole plan of active surveillance is to arise <laughs> a quality of life without you know, minimal impact of anxiety. We'll get to active surveillance in just a brief minute, but the, yeah, the no idea... Let's stick with what you're doing around MRI. I mean, first yeah. off, are you the person that orders up uh, biparametric versus multiparametric? Do you decide who, who gets contrast or not? Or how does uh, that we, play? We've out? actually, we've actually uh, at the clinic uh, stopped doing the uh, the on, the only time that we use the the contrast is for patients with um, um, what do you call it the hip replacements. Um, because it's it's very difficult to see the uh, diffusion weighted part of the, this if you have um, uh, like a tightened hip. What do you call it? Uh, prosthetics, hip prosthetics. Yeah, because then then uh, the the pictures are are disturbed by by uh, this foreign the metal, and then you can um, then the, the you can really have an advantage with the uh, uh, gadolinium uh, contrast. So those are the patients that we use the the contrast today. Everybody else is just biparametric, uh, but it will be. We we are we are discussing with our radiologists, so we work in quite quite close with them all the time. So we decided together that we skip it, um, and uh, we we have our radiology department is really active. And as I started off with saying that we're having a screening study, we have 40,000 men in Western Sweden uh, invited in this uh, screening study when we start off with uh, PSA and then MRI and then biopsies if you have, if you see something on this. So it's, we've been working with them for four years on this study. So we have a dialogue all the time. So we, together we decided we, sk we skip the contrast for now. Excellent. And, yeah. um, what is it? So, is it? Are you looking at and interpreting the MRI scanning imagery, or is someone else and you read a text report? No, no. I, I always look at the pictures. I, I I really, really, really would urge everybody not to just look at it because it's. Uh, and that that's we have we have a conference with the radiologists um, every Thursday morning when we look at, at uh, uh, images together and that is the best way because they I mean they obviously they look at a lot more of these pictures than we do but to learn how to look at them yourself uh, from planning your surgery when looking when to take biopsies where to take the biopsies it's essential to learn how to look at the picture yourself and to interpret the text but also look at the pictures to to get your own image of it so let's talk about what you see what do you see yeah. What are you looking for? Uh, it's um, well, you you look at um, uh, it depends on which one of these. If you have the diffusion, you look at it's um, a quite it's a quite blurry picture. But you, then it's usually uh, white, and then you look for for like darker uh, um, parts of it. Uh, and if you look at the T two weighted, it's also usually a bit smudged darker areas on the picture so it's it's not always it's um not always so very easy to find them and sometimes uh, benign prostatic enlargement looks very much like prostate cancer if you're not um, careful so it's what i usually do i look at all the pictures myself but i 
have the interpretation from the radiologists that are the the experts on looking at these pictures uh, next to the the pictures. So I, I read, I know, so I know where to look, and that's that's when I really know <laughs> how to interpret them. Because to start from, from scratch, if I don't know if it's a cancer or not, then it's really difficult. Then you have to practice this for a while. So there are different stages in a man's life post-diagnosis or pre-diagnosis uh-huh. that yeah. he's that he'll have an opportunity for an MRI, like in the like in before the biopsy, after the elevated PSA. Yeah, I mean, do you really get to see enough to real? I mean, how certain can you or anyone on Earth be? from the best biparametric MRI that a person does or does not present with prostate cancer cells? Well, you can, not, you can never be 100%. But what we've done so far until, if, uh, well, in the past 10, five or 10 years, is that if you had a raise, a raise in P, a high PSA, then, well, before the PSA, then if you had a palpable lesion, uh, then you took biopsies from where you felt something. You put a needle on your finger, and then you try to feel the lesion. And then the Francian uh, biopsy. Uh, then you try to, to to just biopsy what you felt. And then we got the ultrasound and the PSA, and we can start. If you had a race uh, rice in PSA, then you took systematic biopsies. We knew approximately where the the, the tumor usually are in pro- in the prostate. It's usually in the in the uh, peripheral zone. So we took first six and then uh, 10 or 12 biopsies from the peripheral zone. And we found most of the prostate cancer, about 80% first time you try. And then we know that up by doing uh, MRI first and uh, taking biopsies from the area where you see something, then you find more of the significant cancers this way and a lot less of those cancers that would never be a problem. And because the problem with prostate cancer is that it's so common. Uh, it's If you take the prostate out, there've been autopsy studies, a number of them done in uh, with patients died and dying from other car accidents or whatever. And then you look at the prostate and you can say that you can very roughly say that about half of the men uh, age of 60 have prostate cancer cells in their prostate and maybe 60% of the age 70 and i mean it's 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 more than half of them which is but of course not that many would ever get a problem with their prostate cancer so uh, if you take the prostate out you will find a lot of 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 uh, or you just take these random biopsies or the systematic biopsies then you will find a lot of prostate cancer in men that would never ever have a problem with the prostate cancer. Um, so you have a, the, diff, the problem with overdiagnosis. If you just take the PSA, you take the systematic biopsies, then you will overdiagnose a lot of cancers that would never have a problem with this, which may, which in many cases lead to surgery or radiotherapy with side effects uh, for a patient that didn't really need this and anxiety and everything from, from the cancer diagnosis. But we know that we, we find more of the significant cancers with MRI and systematic or and directed biopsies to where you see something and less of the insignificant cancers. But we also know that we don't find all of them. So it's... Uh, so the so just MRI- say that you... Yeah, sorry. No, no, you go. Yeah. So if, if we combine them today and um, in most guidelines that if you have... If, the P- if you don't find anything first uh, and the PSA is still uh, so high that you cannot really explain it with benign prostate enlargement um, or something like that, then uh, you take the systematic biopsies anyway. And uh, if you don't find anything on that and you still don't find anything on the MRI, you should check the PSA maybe a year later or, or something like that to see if it's still going up. And then maybe you should do a new MRI. Uh, and not just let it go. So the MRI is is just showing geography. It's just, it's it's showing more or less, s- yeah. right. Patients are aware of the PIRA of P I R A D S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What is that about? It's about the likelihood that something is prostate cancer. Something that you see is prostate cancer. And it's a five uh, it's a five point scale, and it's uh, it's weighted for between 
both these uh, the uh, T2 weighted uh, MRI, the the geography only, or the the anatomical image, and the diffusion weighted, and uh, and then you can you get a, a combined picture of these, where a Pirates one is that you don't see anything, and a Pirates five is very very likely a prostate cancer, and a Pirates two is hardly ever prostate cancer. A Pirates four is most uh, very quite often prostate cancer and the pirates three is the difficult part and so far the most guidelines says that pirate, the risk of having prostate cancer with the pirates three it's so high that you should do biopsies from three four and five and which is also why you can skip the the um, the uh, the um, uh, the gardelinium or the the um, um, the uh, uh, Sorry, lost the word in English now. Um, um, the contrast in this, because you can make a difference between a three and a four, maybe with the contrast, but you don't really. If if it looks like a number a three, and you you're going to take biopsies from from a pirate's three anyway, then you don't really need to know if it's a three or a four, and that's where the contrast may make a difference. That some of the pirate's threes become pirate's fours if you do the contrast. And by looking at it, the, I mean, the difference between a three, four, and five, is that purely size or the shape and sort of where no, it's No, it's the shape and the location and uh, how the contours are on the sides. Um, difference between four and five is, is to some extent uh, size, but not between a three and four, uh, four in that case. It may have a quite big three, but it still mo uh, may just well as well be a benign nodule in the prostate, but you cannot really tell if it's a, no, a benign nodule or a, a prostate cancer, and that will make it three, and that can be quite big. But the ones that you're fairly certain is prostate cancer, then the size really becomes a difference. So it's five is is uh, usually bigger than, or is bigger than a four. So, so let me repeat back so I can yeah. figure it out in my head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like a three could, or a two or a three could be a stone, it could be a nodule, it could be something, yeah. but it's more of a roundish or oval kind of thing uh, yeah. because that's how they sort of shape out and grow. Or yeah, grow yeah. as they shape yeah. out. But yeah. prostate cancer is more spider-like, more tentacle-like usually. Yeah. And, and those more smudged edges and uh, on these ones. Yeah. Yeah. And that sort of reveals itself as it gets larger, you yeah. know, because, yeah. you know, when you have tentacles, but they're sort of close in, it's yeah. hard to sort of see a small image, you know, so that's the three realm. But yeah. as it gets five and, you know, four and five there, yeah. it's fairly obvious. Yeah. And there's nothing else that would cause that. I mean, nothing else generally that would cause that tentacle like presentation. Is that right? You should no. You, um, well, you cannot say that it's nothing else because there's always exceptions to everything. Yeah. But it's, but say that it's about 80 or 90% likelihood that a pirate's five is a cancer. But sometimes we don't find a cancer, even if it's a pirate's five. So it's you still have to take the biopsies to make sure, and I don't. I, I would not uh, suggest that if you have a pirates five and you're sure that you've taken biopsies from that area and you don't find the cancer, I would not recommend uh, surgery for that patient or, or treatment for that patient. I would sort of continue looking and see what what, what happens a bit, because um, it's it's not conclusive with the MRI. It's suggestive more than conclusive, even if it's a five. So you now have a three, four, a patient with something to look at and something to yeah. target. You take yeah. out some flesh through a biopsy. The pathologist yeah. takes a look at it. Uh, yeah. The patient asks for a second opinion from a different pathologist, which we yeah. feel is good practice, and yeah, yeah. both come yeah. back more or less comparable. You know, yeah. either identical reports or the same or yeah. comparable. Uh, the Gleason six can still have a Pyrads five. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, it can. It's usually not, but it's it can have. It's not the same thing. You have the Gleason. It's 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 very often something you have to explain because you have the Gleason five and the Pirates five, and it's not the same thing. Uh, you may well have a Gleason three plus three, uh, and it in a Pirates five, even though it's usually if it's a Pirates five, it's a more 
aggressive tumor that, that has that look, but it, it doesn't have to be. So the MRI sort of separates out the, let's say the pyrads one and two from yeah. having to suffer through a biopsy in yeah. most cases, Yeah, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, the pyrads three, four, and five still require, um, for most physicians, three, four, and five will yeah. sort of navigate a patient to a biopsy. Yeah. What what hap- What does the MRI do to influence the biopsy? Can, in other words, can if you can target just where the lump is, where yeah. the shadow is, yeah. do, do you really need twelve samples? No, we don't. We I, and that's what you, they shown in a, in a randomized uh, prospective trial that was published a few years ago. And that changed uh, a lot of this. Uh, the thinking about this is that you just target that area um, when you want the diagnosis of prostate cancer, and and if you find something there, there, then it, you, it's unlikely that you miss because if you start doing the twelve samples, then you're back into finding a lot of these um, small tumors that would probably never make make any problems. So it's. It's actually uh, recommended in many in many guidelines to not take the systematic biopsies as a first measure. Yeah, we're we're here in the states, and yeah. particularly in our support group network, which in this we have we used to have eighty two yeah. uh, you know in person support groups. Now uh-huh. everybody's online, which is a nice way to do it. I think. Yeah. yeah. But the the reports back from the guys were that, that they would have 12 samples, traditional yeah. sort of grid style, and uh, yeah. they would, uh, and the MRI would just indicate where uh, sample 13 and 14 would go. In yeah. other words, uh, there'd be uh, that the MRI was actually adding sa- uh, biopsy sampling. Uh, is is there a European USA disconnect around that? Or it, it could be, and that this may be. Uh, it, it it depends it, on. Um, uh, it depends very very much on your on uh, your uh, if you want to find everything. If your if your uh, basic uh, uh, sort of um, uh, will is to find every cancer cell there is then of course you should take more biopsies because we know that systematic plus targeted biopsies and the MRI will find more cancer than if you do just do systematic or just targeted biopsies. But if you at the same time want to, to lower the risk of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, which is a problem for patients, um, in uh, just as big a problem for many patients, or in if for especially if you look at at society, then then the overdiagnosis is a problem, and then you need to to take less biopsies, and then that's when we know that the MRI plus targeted biopsies find less of do less of this overdiagnosis and still finds more of the cancers that we need to find. The the uh, it may be different Europe, the states, when it comes to to insurance and and that you have to, you can be sued if you don't didn't find it if it shows up a few years later or something like that you missed it. I can I can imagine that that could be a problem. The thing is that if you don't find anything the first time, you shouldn't stop. Look, you shouldn't like that. Drop the patient and say that. Well, okay, you don't have anything. You never have to come back. And because if you still have the, the suspicion that this may be something in there that may grow in the future, then you, you check the PSA six or 12 months later and you can redo the MRI, you can do the biopsies. And if it still continues up and you don't see anything on the MRI, then that's maybe the time for the systematic biopsies in that case. But to do all of them in the first case, then you don't get any, because as we said in the beginning, you have the infections, you have the risk of actually getting a serious uh, septicemia. And me- even though it's not many cases, there are, have been cases where people have died from biopsies. And of course, if you take 14 or 16 biopsies, the risk of getting an infection is higher than if you take three or four biopsies. Because it's uh, so, so, so there is a f- a, not just in overdiagnosis, but also to actually getting fewer uh, 
biopsies taken is is an advantage for the individual patient too. Absolutely. The let's talk about active surveillance guys now. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so he's gone through a biopsy, uh, MRI directed, uh, mm-hmm. perhaps a pirate. For uh, yep. the Leeson six on two cores, perhaps um, yep. you know, guy in his sixties, PSA under ten. I mean, that's an yep. active surveillance. Absolutely, yeah. So, what should he be considering around uh, his the activity around his surveillance? Well, the thing is that uh, active surveillance is. Uh, we know that active survey that the risk of dying from prostate cancer if you do active surveillance uh, according to but there there are a myriad of protocols unfortunately on how to do active surveillance uh, you can do it in many different ways uh, but if we know that if you stick to one of these the ones that we long term follow up we for example you take PSA every 6 months you can meet your urologist once a year uh, you can do uh, in the ones that we have long-term follow-up, then you do re-biopsies every, maybe every second year. Uh, then we know that the risk of, of missing the progression of this prostate cancer or dying from prostate cancer within 15, 20 years is extremely low. Uh, there, are, there are patients that have uh, progression of the tumor, but then you do uh, surgery or radiotherapy at the time of the progression. And um, in worst case scenario, you have you have saved a, a few years of, of possible side effects and then you do the surgery five or five years later or something like that. But in the best case scenario, then you never have to do uh, surgery or radiotherapy and you never have to, to have these uh, side effects. So uh, active surveillance guys should be considering an annual MRI or how does that work? What Probably not. The, the problem is that this is where we don't really know uh, because uh, as I said, the, the, the active surveillance as a concept we know is safe, uh, but the long-term follow-up, we have a 15-year follow-up fire from Gothenburg. We have a really long one from Klotz Group in Vancouver. We have like really long time follow-up from, from active surveillance cohorts. And uh, in those, you can see that, uh, that what those have been with repeat biopsies. Uh, MRI is new and we don't know if you can see progression, we should be able to see progression on MRI. We think that we can do that, but we don't have the evidence. We don't have the long time follow up because we haven't used MRI for a long time enough. And the few randomized trials that there are um, actually show that if you have a progression on the MRI, it's probably a progression of the tumor. But if you don't see any progression on the MRI, just as you said, with the since it it's sort of it, it grows uh, along the um, the the gland uh, glandular structures inside the prostate, it's not just one lump being bigger. It sort of grows uh, in a different way inside the prostate. Then it's not sure that you can see that the it growing or or de differentiated becoming a higher Gleason grade on the MRI, which means that. Uh, you could probably not take away the uh, repeat biopsies in active surveillance completely. Uh, there are a number. There are a few studies. We have a, a Nordic study called the SPCG17. It's a Scandinavian Prostate Cancer Group. We have a, a study where we try to look at at uh, MRI instead of biopsies because it's the same thing. We Biopsies are dangerous in, in in a way. It's not. I'm not trying to scare anybody here because they're not that dangerous. But it's. On a population basis, if you take thousands of biopsies, then you have you're bound to have some pe- people that get really sick from this, and so we need to get the number of biopsies down. And MRI is probably the way forward, but so far we're not hundred percent sure on how to use this. So the guidelines, uh, both national and the European guidelines today, uh, say that you, if you have something that indicates progression, either MRI or PSA progression or something like that, or you can a palpable progression, then you should do uh, both uh, targeted and systematic biopsies at that time. But when it's very vague though on how often you should do the MRI and how often you should do the, the uh, biopsies today. So we don't really know in the guidelines. It's almost a, a discussion about morality. 
you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it, yeah. you know, where does inter, where does, uh, when do we do things that are good versus doing things that are bad in service of hoping to do something good? Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's a question that most of us should never face ever, but, no. uh, you know, like it or not, when your PSA is going up, uh, you know, it's time to start thinking a bit, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And of course, for you as a physician, seeing many patients per day, you know, it's yeah. something that you probably face in, in your dreams and your sleep. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but it's, it's uh, the, the active surveillance protocol, I think, uh we don't know 100% which protocol uh to use and how to use how often you should do the mri but so far there's very few protocols that has done biopsies more than biannually uh if everything else is stable if the psa is stable you don't see any difference in the uh you know, on the ultrasound or you can uh, do a see, feel a palpable difference then uh, uh, you do you don't do biopsies more than every second year, so you probably don't have to do it more often than that. And we know that 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 uh, regime works for fifteen twenty years, uh, so it's probably uh, enough with that. If if you should do only uh, MRI or you should do biopsies now and then also if it's stable, then we don't know. But if your PSA is rising, then you should definitely do an MRI targeted biopsies if you see something on that one, or probably systematic biopsies if you don't see any difference on that one, um, to, to, to see what happens. Uh, yeah. Before we close out this conversation, and yeah. certainly I think very helpful to a lot of people listening, uh, a couple of quick things. Uh, can an MRI see metastases either about to occur or occurring? Um, not very accurately. We can see if you have uh, enlarged lymph nodes, uh, you can see, well, it's, it's very good to see if you have metastasis in the skeleton. The MRI is really is, is good for that. But if you really want to look for metastasis, then um, probably something like the PSMA PET scan, which is a different mode. It's, um, um, it's a, you, you inject a substance that it's attached to the, the surface of, of prostate cancer cells with, with a small radioactive, um, um, it emits a small uh, little bit of radioactivity that you can detect and combine with a, a CT scan. And that is probably the most um, uh, sensitive way of looking for, for metastasis today. The problem with that is also that it's new and maybe false positive that it looks like metastasis while it's not because uh, this PSMA uh, substance is taken up into salivary glands and in your ventricle and different other parts of the body too. So it may look like, uh, but the MRI is not great in looking at if you don't have uh, large lymph nodes or really like, like proper metastasis in the skeleton, then you can see them. But not just if it's something that small cells going up. You can't see that. Another thing, um, sort of off track, but it's it's done in some places here in the states. The idea of doing the biopsy within the MRI core. Yeah. Um, what What are your thought? I mean, have you ever done that? What's that like? No, I haven't done that. But it's 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 quite difficult to do it. It's I mean, of course, if you have the image and you do the and you want to uh, target exactly where you can see something on the MRI. Then of course, the, the, to do the, the biopsy when you have the patient in, in the machine, then you're, they're bound to hit what it is. Uh, but there, there, there are three different ways of targeting uh, what you see on the MRI. And that is one of them. The other one is that you can do a cognitive fusion, that you can look at the images, you can see where the the picture is, and then you look with your ultrasound, and in your head, you combine these two. So you can look at whether this is where the, the lesion should be when you have the MRI picture next to you. Uh, and then you in your head, you fusion them, and you take uh, biopsies from, from uh, where you see the, the, the lesion. Or you can do this uh, in a... Um, 
in a machine fusion way that you you fusion the MRI picture with the ultrasound picture in the software in the in your machine, and you take targets uh, and that one guides you to take the the targeted pictures. The thing is that. Um, there are uh, at least one randomized study when they compare these three modes. Uh, the easiest way is that you have the picture and you have your MRI, uh, or you have your MRI picture and you have your ultrasound, and you fusion them in your head. If you're used to your ultrasound, uh, the most expensive or the most difficult one is to take it inside the the MR machine because it's it's if anybody's been there, it's it's quite tight uh, space that you have to get into in order to take these biopsies. Um, and in the randomized study, you couldn't see any difference really in the detection rate of, of these three modes. So if, you, if you're used to looking at the MRI pictures and used to using the ultrasound, then I think the cognitive fusion is, is good enough in that case and a lot less difficult to do. And a lot yeah. less expensive, both for the facility and yeah. right. And you know that's sort of perhaps worth ending or coming close to ending on the idea yeah. that MRIs are just not available everywhere on the earth. No, the, yeah. you know, and not for, only that. You only it, not only the machine. You have to have a good radiologist that is really looked at a lot of these. So if you just do one or two, then then I don't think the machine is the thing either. You have to have but, a combination. Isn't that solved now by telemetry? Like you could have a, a, a readings by people distant from where you're located? Oh, yeah, yeah, but you have to do that. That's true. If you have the machine, but you need a radiologist that is uh, is really used to looking at these and working mostly with uh, looking at prostate because it's difficult. That's what I say. I'm not looking at the, the like the, the, if, if to see if there is a tumor or not. I look at the MRIs when I know there is a tumor and the radiologist can help guide, help me a little bit on where to look on the images. Then I'm quite good at looking at them to see where it, how big it is or where it grows. But to start from scratch, then it's, it's much more difficult. Do you think there'll be uh, an opportunity for uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence? Absolutely. To yeah. Absolutely. This is where artificial intelligence uh, has the biggest potential in medicine at the time. That is e image interpretation. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, certainly around pathology, it seems to be, uh, and people are doing it. So to yeah, speak. yeah. And yeah. I think Philips has a, a product yeah. around that. Um, yeah. yeah. But is uh, but I'm not familiar at all. Um, is are, is there software now for uh, machine interpretation of MRIs? I'm not prostate? sure if there is commercially available software, but it's definitely I know at least uh, three or four groups that are working on them, and that's just that I know of now. I mean, they're working on it in Stockholm. There, they have different groups, and we have a, a team at this hospital that are working on machine learning on looking at. Um, not so far MRI. It's it's the PET CTs uh, so far, but they are work, they are working themselves into this too. So it's 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 really 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 uh, going to be the future in in image interpretation in in medicine whatsoever. So it's in five or ten years, then um um it's it's not going to be uh, up to radiologist or the pathologist in the same way. No, and th that would be brilliant for everyone, I think. Uh, you know, just, I mean, aside from the economy, the confidence that it breeds in a patient to not have to worry, is their doctor better or worse than their neighbor's yeah, yeah. doctor? Yeah. Uh, the uh, And you'll always have a doctor looking at things. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I don't think the radiologists, I don't, when we talk to them at our clinic here, they're not worried of being out unemployed with this, but it's going to be help for them too. So it's... Um, but it, it's it's and it can, to screen out the ones that is nothing on and and uh, the ones that are really obvious and then you have the the like the the difficult cases and then you have maybe have two or three radiologists that can can work together on those yeah. and the telemedicine is is good in that way because I mean we had a patient uh, uh, or um, 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 MRI sent in to us for this conference that I've talked about that was Pirates Five and they had done multiple biopsies on this one. I didn't, couldn't find anything. And our radiologist started looking at it and said, I'm, I'm not sure. And in the end, there was one uh, radiologist from us, the most experienced one, the most experienced in Stockholm, and one uh, that was working from Oman, that all three looked at these pictures and said, no, it's a Pirates 3 and you can drop it. 
So it's, <laughs> but it's a, it's a consensus. But I mean, it's you you can bring the the uh, the um, the knowledge in from everywhere in this, and it's it's fairly easy to do. Yeah, and essential. Dr. Yeah. Strana, thank you very much for uh, taking time with us. Thanks for uh, taking care of your patients and taking care of our community. And uh, welcome to our conference. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay.